Hello, hello. Welcome to this uh, short conversation uh, with our good friend, Professor Will Ely from Vanderbilt, who is, as we know, a world expert on delirium. And so let's speak about delirium. Uh, we know it's quite common. We have all seen it many times in our ICUs. We know it's associated with the worst prognosis. But we would like to be very practical, very pragmatic. And we will ask uh, Wes first, um, have we made some improvement in the prevention of delirium? Of course, we need to treat whatever is abnormal, the electrolyte problems, the sepsis, we need to apply good medicine. We should avoid over sedation, have a humane approach, but anything really new. Yeah, there are some really new things. You know, for about 50 years, we used antipsychotics routinely for delirium. And now through our Mind USA trial, which we published in the New England Journal in 2018, we know that antipsychotics don't treat delirium. They can help calm the patient and they do not suppress the respiratory drive. So they're still very good drugs for people. And I use them all the time, but I do not use them to treat delirium. No, I'm speaking just, out about prevention. I was speaking about prevention before a treatment. Can we do something better to prevent very delirium? Very good. Yes. The, I think the best prevention of delirium is basically early mobilization and having people awake and conversing with them. The more that somebody interacts with people they know, like their family, the, yeah. the less sensory deprivation they get. And then the last two things I would mention on prevention is that that thing about sensory deprivation. If people have a difficulty hearing or seeing or have problems with their sleep wake cycles. So I always emphasize hearing aids, eyeglasses, and at night, turn that darn TV off and let the patient sleep. Absolutely, that's very important. Uh, do you think that giving a little bit of sedative agents at night could help, like a little bit of midazolam to sleep better? Midazolam doesn't help you sleep better. It calms the patient down and it makes the nurse happy because they're not interacting perhaps but it actually suppresses slow wave sleep and, and probably contributes to way more delirium. And that's a great point. What it does is convert a hyperactive delirium patient into a hypoactive delirium patient. And, um, and we have to remember, Jean-Louis, that the main thing you're looking for with delirium is inattention. You can have somebody at a RAS of plus or minus, meaning they're agitated or sedated and they're still attentive. And if they are attentive, able to pay attention on, for example, a, a little test of squeezing hands on a certain letter or a number, then they don't have delirium. Likewise, you could have somebody wide awake in the ICU at a RAS zero and be very inattentive and still delirious. Yeah, so you, you, you mixed a little bit of prevention and the treatment. If I ask you now specifically, once I have identified delirium, of course I need to continue what they have started, communication, etc. But there is no pharmacological therapy except for agitation, right? Well, uh, the way that I approach delirium treatment-wise is I think of this mnemonic called the Dr. Dre, uh, diseases, drug removal, and environment. So I first think of, as you said earlier, the diseases causing it, treat those, sepsis, hypoxemia, et cetera. The drugs that are causing it, get rid of them, so get rid of benzos, get rid of anticholinergic drugs, and then the environment, and we talked about eyeglasses, hearing aids, and sleep. In addition though, Jean-Louis, we can give drugs which are less deliriogenic, like for example, alpha-2 agonists or propofol are probably safer drugs to use than these other drugs like uh, overuse of narcotics or uh, benzodiazepines. Yeah, yeah, very good, but no specific agents, right? No specific agent. We just published a paper called the MENS-2 study in the New England Journal of Medicine, where we randomized propofol versus dexmedetomidine. And I actually thought that the alpha-2 agonist was going to yeah. create less delirium, but it did not. It was the yeah. same as propofol. Yeah, right. So you are a great advocate of the uh, objective assessment of uh, delirium. I have always been a bit doubtful about it because if there is nothing specific about the approach, what does it change to identify delirium? Tell me. Yeah, exactly. I know, and I know you're dubious of it. And the reason that I think it's important is because when I or a nurse or another colleague recognizes that somebody is inattentive, we can at least just pay attention to the dignity and the personness of this human being in the bed and realize, oh my gosh, 
their brain isn't working. I can do some little things to adjust their care today, like getting rid of a drug, getting them mobilized, making sure they have more time with their family that brings that person's brain back into focus. And then that person can communicate themselves to others about what they care about and what matters to them. Um, I find that what I do as a doctor is I think too often about what's the matter with a person. Instead, I need to be thinking about what matters to a person. And I can't know that if they're delirious. Very good. Yeah, very good. And um, have we found some better ways to, to communicate with the relatives? I suppose you have uh, uh, open ICU visits in Vanderbilt, uh, as in many U.S. centers. We are fighting to have them in Europe, uh, but I suppose you are in favor of uh, open ICU visits. I really am. I think that if you add the family into the A, B, C, D, E, F bundle, the F, I, call, I just call it the A to F bundle. If you add the family in, I, what I, the way I do that is that I bring them into rounds. And when I round, the resident or the intern presents after the nurse, the nurse goes first, then the resident, and then I turn to the family member and give them a lay summary, 30 seconds, one minute max, and they can ask a question or two. And what happens is that person gets to advocate hey, my, my brother is a dog lover. Can, can we uh, bring in some videos of his dog? Or my brother likes this or that. And we pay attention and hear that family out about what they, what they need that we're not doing for that person. But I think I've seen some pictures huh? at Vanderbilt. You, you sometimes bring a dog in the ICU, right? We do. I had a, a dog in a bed of a mailman recently. The mailman had spent his life afraid of dogs because he'd been bitten. But then recently he had grown to love them. And that guy's heart rate was 120, 130 for, for two solid days. We put his dog in the bed and without any other treatment changes, his heart rate went down into the 70s and 80s. And that guy was in a coma. I mean, I think it made a huge difference. Just somehow he knew that that dog was there. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And so now with the COVID or recently with the COVID, uh, did you use more iPads and other ways, Zoom programs, et cetera, allowing better communication with the relatives? We did, Jean-Louis. We were one of the first ICUs to open back up to visitation. And I think that actually one of the good things that came out of COVID is that we now will use these devices going forward forever for patients and families who are in other cities and states who can't get there. You know, before we were just relying on people to physically be there, but now we can get somebody a thousand miles away to visit with their loved one. And so I think it's now going to be a mixed approach to family visitation. In person is always better, but hey, these devices can help. Yeah, very good. Yeah, that, that's really very, very important. You know, we, we sometimes face the problem that the relatives want to run out of the ICU. They don't like to stay in the ICU. And we try to keep them at the bedside. We say, no, 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 stay. Your loved one needs you. Uh, is it also your experience sometimes? I, what I do is I just try and ask them, what are you afraid of? You know, try and address what's their fear. It's kind of like yeah. the vaccination for COVID. You know, why aren't you getting vaccinated? Tell me your fear. And each person has their own story to tell. And then I can help them with that individual fear. So it's really a case-by-case -case basis. Very good. I think it's a very important point. Any last item that you would like to raise? Anything else which is new in the field of uh, humane uh, um, support and um, avoidance of uh, delirium? Yes, I'll leave you with one other point. You know, I think that it's important for the listener to realize that Every day of delirium adds 20, 30% likelihood of long-term cognitive impairment on the back end. In, yeah. in our New England paper in 2013, the Brain ICU study, that was the number one risk factor for long-term cognitive impairment or dementia. What we're doing now is we're actually studying computerized computer games to cognitively rehab the brain and get that cognition back. We have two uh, federally funded investigations where we're randomizing patients to these fancy types of cognitive rehabilitation. So there are things that you can do too, but if you don't have computer games, just word games, number games, Sudoku, Scrabble, these things I think can help build that, those neuron connections back again. Very good. And last word about virtual reality. Do you believe that this could help the patients in the ICU? I think it might. We're not using that in our investigations, but I'm, I'm, I'm totally curious about it. And I'd love to hear from others if they are. 
they start to use it in the operating room as well for minor uh, procedures. They you know, investigate the possibility to avoid sedation using sure. uh, this type of technology. You know, Jean-Louis, in our field, we're so focused on diseases like sepsis. And I just want the, the listener to realize this is a form of organ dysfunction, just like shock, just like ARDS, just like right. AKI. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the delirium is the way that the brain fails. And so when it does fail, let's do our best to first recognize it, prevent it if possible, and then try and get that person back again using mobility, uh, disease remediation, getting rid of drugs that are hurting the patient, and then getting that family to the bedside. Those are my take homes. Very good, my good friend. Thank you. Thank you very much for Thank this. You. Very nice comments. It's very interesting. Take care. We'll see you in Brussels soon. See you in Brussels soon. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.